Great. Well, I wonder for each of you this week if you have had a highlight in your week. There's been something in your week that has been a great thing that's happened, that when I say what was a highlight, it comes straight to mind. Maybe it's something that's really personal. Maybe it's something to do with your family. Maybe it's even a work thing. Oh, imagine if we had highlights in our workplaces. <laughs> My highlight this week has been something that's taken place not just once, but multiple times. It's taken place at different points over this week as different groups from this church have met together and have read the whole Gospel of Luke in just a week and then have met together to talk about it. We've had church members, people who attend regularly, people who only sort of are associated with CBC. We've had young adults, some of our older congregation, those who've been around CBC for decades, and even people who turned up for the first time last Sunday. There's even families at home looking at these passages together and discussing it with their children. People have gathered in house groups and families and in every single room in this building. And in total, we've got at least 350 people taking part in Immerse. Now, it's amazing, but it's not that people are taking part in a course that is my highlight. It's, that's fantastic, but that's not why it's my hi highlight. It's not that we got lots of people to sign up. But actually, it's because people are reading the Word of God <laughs> and talking about it with each other exploring it and saying, God, what are you saying to us in this time from your word? And what's even made it a bigger highlight for me have been the conversations I've been able to have with people. The conversations that I've overheard, the messages that we've had, the emails from people sharing their excitement about reading the word of God. So it's not just that people are reading but they're excited about reading the Word of God. I've had emails and messages about the joys of the conversations from groups. And if you were here on Tuesday night or Thursday afternoon, you know we were talking about our coconuts, our hard-to-crack questions. One of my highlights has been receiving coconuts this week and trying to work out what on earth we do with them. The reason this is my highlight, the reason I am excited about this is that the Word of God is active and alive. The Word of God is flawless. The Word of God endures forever. And it is the sword of the Spirit which we are instructed to take up and put on every day if we are to stand firm in this world. That's why I'm excited. Because as a church, we've said we're committed to this, that we recognize this. It's not about what we're doing here, but it's about the fact that we have opened ourselves to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us through the Word of God. Because that's what happens when we read the Word of God, is that the Holy Spirit works in us and He changes us. That's how we're changed. It moves us from reading the Word of God as just a piece of literature, like any other book. But also we get to hear God's Word. And it's amazing. And as part of this on Sundays, we are continuing to explore some of the passages in a bit more detail. So last week we had John Taylor here, and he was helping us to look at one of the passages from Luke. And this evening, in our evening service, John Goddard is going to be taking us through a passage from, I think it's in First Thessalonians tonight, John. Yes, he's giving me a nod. Good. We're in First Thessalonians tonight. But this morning, we are going to be looking at Acts 18. Is it possible to get the PowerPoint up, please? Um, we are going to be in Acts chapter 18. And we're going to be thinking about Paul in Corinth and what we learn from Paul's time in Corinth. But before we get to the passage, I thought it might be helpful to 
look at the context, because that's what we like to do. We like to know what on earth we're talking about, where we're talking about, who we're talking about. And if we're going to look at Paul's time in Corinth, we kind of need to know a bit about Corinth. It's helpful to know what was going on in Corinth at the time. So I thought we'd start with a little bit of geography not working. Great, thanks. So I don't know how well you can see this, but Corinth is in Greece, okay? There is a modern day Corinth. It's only a mile or two up the road from where ancient Corinth was. So we're roughly about the same kind of place. I did, it was slightly easier in the nine o'clock to point. This will send the cameras wild because I don't know if they cover back here. Athens, right here. Corinth's very close to Athens. Can we click onto the next slide? Okay, so this is the south of Greece. You didn't know you were coming for a geography lesson today, did you? <laughs> south of Greece. Up here, Athens. Slightly west of Athens, we've got Corinth. And Corinth is on a really, really narrow piece of land that joins the Peloponnese, so that's the bit with the, that looks like three fingers sticking down at the bottom of Greece, joins that part to the northern part, the kind of mainland part of Greece. And in fact, Corinth is on such a narrow piece of land that before the Corinth Canal was built, boats used to dock in the east and they would empty all the cargo out of a boat and they would carry it across the land and stick it in a boat in the dock in the west and sail it out from there. Because it was much safer and much faster and much easier to do that than to sail the boat round the south of Greece. And in fact, it's in such a small bit of land, such a narrow piece of land, that if the boats weren't even huge boats, they didn't even empty the cargo. They just got the boat out of the water, stuck it on some rollers, and rolled it to the other port. It was a major, major trade route. In this slightly wider geography here, we can see that Corinth is accessible from the east by the sea, from countries such as Turkey and Cyprus, from Lebanon and Israel, from the south by countries in northern Africa, and from the west by countries like Italy. Geographically, it was in an amazing place. History-wise, we're definitely not working. You guys are going to have to work with me. This is going to be fun. <laughs> History-wise, Corinth grew and grew in size and prosperity right up until about 146 BC. So this is about 100, 150 to 200 years before our passage. And people were getting richer and more and more people were moving there. And then it got attacked it was leveled, and every single person in the population was sold into slavery. So in 146 BC, the entire population is wiped out, and the whole city is leveled. But 100 years later, Julius Caesar, probably recognizing the potential for trade <laughs> from its geographical position, Julius Caesar decided that actually it needed to be rebuilt. And so he set about rebuilding the city of Corinth. And in 27 BC, it becomes the capital of the Roman province of Achaia. It again gathers its importance. It's recognized as a really, really important place. In New Testament times, the time we're just about to read, it has a population of over 200,000 people. Now, we might say, oh, that's not massive for a city. But to put it into context, at the same time, Athens had a population of 10,000. So Athens, 10,000. Corinth, 200,000. It's a huge difference. Corinth was populated with Greeks and freedmen from Italy, Roman army veterans, businessmen, government officials, people from Cyprus, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, the Palestinian territories, Turkey. It was multicultural. There was lots of prosperity. And it was also home to a number of Jews. And the prosperity kept increasing in the city. They even hosted the Isthmian Games every two years. This is a picture potentially from the Isthmian Games. And this is like the Olympic Games. It was part of the Olympic Games cycle. So in year one, 
you would have the Olympic Games on year two, you would have the Isthmian Games in Corinth. Year three, the games went somewhere else. And year four, they came back to Corinth again. Corinth was important enough to have two lots of games for every Olympic cycle. And prosperity, next slide please, prosperity brought with it building and grand architecture. And much of this was focused around worshipping gods and lots of gods. But probably the main worship in Corinth was the goddess Aphrodite or Venus, the goddess of love. They also worshipped the gods of sailors and safe passages, the gods of healing and many, many other pagan gods. And this just added continuously to a level of immorality that was beyond anything known anywhere else in the world at that time. The temple of Aphrodite, for example, was served by a thousand female slaves who were then left to roam the city streets at night as prostitutes. Corinth was so associated with immorality, and particularly sexual immorality, that the term to Corinthianize actually means to be sexually immoral. The, t the city's name is another term for being immoral. And this is the city to which Paul goes. A city with all this going on, yet with a decent number of Jews around, and perhaps even with some members of the early church living in the city. So we're going to turn to our passage and we're going to read together. We've got a bit of an idea now about this place in which we're going to find Paul. We're going to read chapter 18, verses 1 to 11, and I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Does anybody know? If you had a geography lesson, we're about to have a quiz. Does anybody know why Paul left Athens? Does anybody know why Paul was in Athens? Oh, we're doing well this morning. Does anybody know where he'd come from to go to Athens? Iona, shout it really loud from the back. He had. He'd been in Thessalonia, and there there had been troubles, there had been riots, and the Jews were getting kicked out and moved on. But Paul was, it was suggested that Paul was inciting the riots. And so for his safety, the Christians said, look, Paul, go, move on to the next place. And he was with Timothy and Silas, but they didn't come at that point. They were doing some other things. So he goes on to Athens and says, I'll wait for you guys there. They don't quite catch up with him in Athens, and then we find him moving on to Corinth. So that's where we're at. So Paul leaves Athens and went to Corinth, and there he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla, probably kicked out, as we read in the next bit, because the Jews were getting into trouble there, probably because of Jesus. <laughs> so some Jews were saying Jesus was the Messiah, some were saying he weren't, they were having fights, and so they just all got kicked out. So they had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers just as he was. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike and after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, your blood is upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go preach to the Gentiles. Then he left and went to the home of Titus just Justice, a Gentile who worshipped God and lived next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord, and many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers, and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, Don't be afraid, speak out, don't be silent. 
for I am with you and no one will attack and harm you. For many people in this city belong to me. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half, teaching the word of God. Let's just pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, yeah, just as we're thinking about at the start, that your word is living and active, that Lord, it changes us. And so we just open ourselves right now to you. Come and speak to us. Come and change us. Come and challenge us in this place today. Amen. So we've got Paul in Corinth. He's found some other believers who he goes to live with and work with. He goes to the synagogue each Sabbath to share the gospel. And after a while, his mates turn up again. Timothy and Silas appear. And it seems that Timothy and Silas bring with them some good news. Okay, so other bits of information that we've got suggest that they brought news of things being a bit more encouraging than Thess in Thessalonica than they were when Paul had left. But they also bring a gift from Philippi, a financial gift from Philippi, which means that Paul can now devote his time to preaching the word, to sharing the gospel. But it's not all easy. Paul's been facing insults and troubles all over the place, and he does again here. But instead of leaving, here he shakes the dust from his clothes and he goes to share the gospel with other people. There's a bunch of people not listening, so he says, right, that's fine, I'll just go and share it with more people. And he goes to share it with Gentiles. But that doesn't mean the Jewish people weren't impacted. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, comes to faith. Other people come to faith. But even in the midst of people coming to faith in a growing church in Corinth, even in the midst of encouraging news from Thessalonica and Philippi, Paul isn't finding it easy. There's lots of good, but also some difficult situations. He's been insulted. He's been asked questions. There's uncertainty. He's been dismissed. He's been threatened. And God sees how all of this is affecting, reminding Paul of words that Paul would have known really well. Do not be afraid. The Lord is with you. I'm not going to spend long, I'm not going to explore that really just now, but I just get a sense that even as I mention that, that somebody needs to hear those words today. <laughs> Do not be afraid. The Lord is with you. Whatever situation it is, and I just suggest that you give that to God right now. But then we get one last verse at the end of our passage here. And in that one last verse, Luke summarizes an entire 18 months worth of work. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half teaching the word of God. 18 months, one verse. <laughs> so we've got a bit of an idea about Corinth and the kind of place it was. We know what's going on in the story. But what does it mean for us? What are we supposed to take from these verses? What impact is it supposed to have on our lives? Can you jump two slides for me, please? Thank you. Firstly, I believe we are called to reach Corinth without being Corinthianized. We're called to reach Corinth without being Corinthianized. So said already, in Paul's time, in the time of Acts, Corinth had a reputation. Paul does not go to Corinth without knowing that reputation. It wasn't just a reputation in Corinth. Everybody knew what Corinth was like. And so when he goes, he knows what he's going into. He'd been well aware of the reputation of the city. Wealth, luxury, prosperity, immorality. He could have avoided Corinth altogether. Paul had lots of plans to go to lots of places. There's places he was desperate to go to that he didn't get to in the end. But he still chooses to go to Corinth. He could have judged it as being beyond saving. There were plenty of other people that would have judged it that way. He could have been like Noah, uh, Jonah saying he wasn't going to go to Nineveh. But he doesn't. He goes to Corinth and he preaches the word of God. He talks with people, Jews and Gentiles, teaching them all that Jesus had taught. 
And the big thing is that he doesn't become like the people in order to share the gospel with them. He doesn't start acting like them in order to share the gospel with them. Paul, when he's writing to the church in Rome, says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Or the version that lots of us would know, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul's the first person to urge us to live lives that are obviously different to the world around us. And he lives by example. He goes to Corinth, but is not Corinthianized. He doesn't do it in his own strength. Paul knows we need the Holy Spirit to work in us. But I think it's all too easy for us to fall into the patterns of the world around us. I come up against two, or come across two different trains of thought among many Christians in this whole topic. One is either that the world is so corrupt and immoral that we just need to remove ourselves from it and stay in our little holy huddle because there's nothing we can do to change it. And then the other is, well, you just need to become like the people around you if you want them to hear the gospel. But I think Paul shares us, shows us a third option, a better option. Go to Corinth, wherever that is, Share Jesus with Corinth, but don't be Corinthianized. Our life should be different to the lives of those around us because our life should reflect Jesus. So we should stand out. We should look different. We shouldn't conform to the patterns of those around us. We don't just accept things because it's what the culture says and the way the culture lives if it comes against the word of God. It's all too easy to become Corinthianized. Pop on the next slide. Okay. There are some people who are called to what we, I would say, very wrongly term full-time ministry. People who are paid in a ministry role. Okay. But there are very few people who are called to that. The majority of the people of God are called to be tent makers, to be in a full-time ministry of doing a job, loving the people in that job and sharing Jesus with them every single day. There are not two sets of Christians, one lot that are paid to tell people about Jesus and the other that go and do secular jobs. We're all called to share Jesus. Paul, whether he was tent making or in a, the equivalent of a paid ministry job, shares Jesus. In both of those places, he shares Jesus. It doesn't matter whether you're called to be an accountant, a teacher, a stay-at-home parent, a doctor, a cleaner, a carer, a musician, whatever, you work in IT or HR, many, many other spheres, you are called to share Jesus in that sphere. A couple of months ago, Steffi and I stood here and we talked about our front lines. What, where is the place that you spend most of your week? Where are you called to be? What job are you doing? What family are you amongst? What about your friends, your community, your neighborhood? You are called to share Jesus in that place. Sharing Jesus has not been delegated to a few people who work or get paid by the church. What does tent making look like in your life? What does it look like to go about your everyday tasks, your job, your family, and to share Jesus in those spaces, to talk of him, to show people how much they're loved, to challenge where challenge is needed? What does it look like to do that? We use this term around sharing Jesus of evangelism. And sometimes it's a ter one of those terms we kind of use, we don't necessarily know what we're talking about or what it, what it really means. 
But ultimately, evangelism is making a serious declaration based on personal knowledge. It's saying, I've had an encounter with Jesus and I want you to know about it. I've looked at the word of God and I want to share it with you. And we each have a personal responsibility to share not only the truth, but the undiluted truth. Can we get the next slide? At Merce, I heard a number of groups chatting about being really struck as they've kind of read Luke in a short period of time with all the headings and everything taken out, felt like it was very condensed and were really struck by what felt like almost a harshness in how Jesus came across at times. Because it was intense. The truth is that yes, the gospel is good news. Yes, it is about being loved. And it's about being loved by the one who is love and gave everything for you. But the gospel is also a difficult message. It's a challenging message to hear. And it requires a response. And that response cannot be, that's nice, I'll carry on living the way I was. But that's me sorted for when I die. That's not an option when it comes to the gospel. The gospel requires a whole life commitment to the one who gave it all for you. It involves whole life transformation. It involves a change of allegiance, a change of values, and a change of priorities. Because the truth is that a watered-down gospel is no gospel at all. A watered-down, culturified gospel is not good news. In Matthew 28, Jesus gives what we call the Great Commission. And he says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then often when we talk about this passage, we kind of stop and we jump over and we go to the bit where he says, and I'll be with you always. And we miss the bit in between. But that bit in between says, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Not pick and choose the bits you like. Not choose the bits that are a little bit easier. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Radical, life changer, changing, cultural changing obedience. And obedience is a word we don't like in this culture. <laughs> but it's biblical. It's of the gospel. Paul stays for a year and a half teaching the word of God. He doesn't just wander around Corinth going, it's all right, carry on with your life, but Jesus loves you anyway. <laughs> he calls people to change. He teaches the word of God. Of course Jesus loved the people of Corinth. Of course he loves the people of this culture and this world. But he loves us so much that he doesn't want us to stay the same. He loves us too much for us just to stay the same. He wants so much more for us. He has so much more for us. But we need to choose that. We need to say, I'm in and I'm willing to allow the Holy Spirit to come and do that change in me. The call to follow Jesus is not a call to find a crutch but it's a revolutionary call. A revolutionary call that we have a responsibility to share, but also to step into in our own lives. We cannot share a diluted gospel because there is no such thing. We cannot be people who simply become like the culture around us, writing it off as, well, that will make it easier to tell people about Jesus because the call is for us to be different. The call is for us to stand out. Among 200,000 people in Corinth, I bet you Paul was well known. Let's pray together. 
God, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the example of Paul. We thank you, God, for his obedience. Not just in where he went, but also in how he acted of what he spoke of. And we thank you, God, for the challenge that there is for us in that. God, I pray for each one of us today. If there are things in our life where you're challenging us about how we've just become like the culture around us, we'd be open to let you change us. God, if we've forgotten about our responsibility to share you in our workplaces, would you remind us of that? But God, as well, would you help us to be people of this revolutionary call? who don't try to water down the gospel to make it more palatable for people around us, but instead who are stick with the whole truth. People who take on the whole truth, live it and share it every day. Amen.